Yeah. Great. So then let's start because, um, uh, of course, we have an exciting hour ahead. Um, as I mentioned, this is the uh, second part in the webinar series on standards for different menstrual products, um, co uh, co-hosted um, by the Menstrual, uh, Health, <laughs> Menstrual Health Alliance India, the African Coalition for MHM, the Reproductive Health Supply Coalition and Wash United on behalf of Menstrual Hygiene Day. A month ago, we hosted a webinar on disposable menstrual products for which we're happy to share also the link and recording in case you missed it. And today is all about reusable menstrual products, um, which includes um, uh, pads, but also panties. So what topics will we cover today? So we won't, don't want to duplicate uh, similar discussions we had last week, but we used the same fo format. So first we start with an overview of different types of reusables. And then we look at standardization um, parameters and discuss uh, particularly what is available and um, also if it should it should be tested and feasibility and and uh, technical requirements also given um, that uh, the testing can be limited and difficult for small scale product uh, production companies um, we will have an overview of existing standard landscapes as far as we know of and um, close with some gaps and challenges uh, please add your points and questions into the chat box throughout the webinar. At the end, we'll definitely open up for um, a Q&A, but we will also reflect on your questions throughout the webinar. Who are the speakers today? So I'm very glad that we have Sophia Sonia, or Sonia from AfriPads. She's providing the keynote, meaning the input presentation on all the key um, points I mentioned before. Um, as speakers, uh, to dive a little bit deeper and answer specific questions, we have Torben Olm Larsen from Real Relief Way, Shivani Swami from Living Guard, and Audrey Anderson Duquette from Be Girl. Um, we and we was also supposed to have Mahesh Nagesar from the South African Bureau of Standard, but unfortunately is ill and there's a, a lockdown <laughs> coming in South Africa. So he had uh, just cancelled, and I think we all understand uh, why and um, uh, that under this given situation, it can be quite challenging. Um, we included some of his points in the presentation that I'm going to read out, and uh, um, if you have any questions, we can direct those questions to him later as well. Yeah, so uh, that's the outline. and. Uh, yeah, let's uh, start and I hand over to Sophia for her first slides on the keynote. Hi everyone, um, so this is Sophia from AfriPads. I'm also uh, the lead of the task force for the African Coalition for Menstrual Health Management when it comes to product standards. So it's great to be able to share some of the knowledge out there uh, and hopefully get more people involved and interested in standards. Um, so as a starting point, what we want to do is just uh, make sure we all know what we're looking at and talking about today. Now, when it comes to reusable menstrual products, um, and we're not discussing menstrual cups today, uh, it means that we're largely talking about reusable pads. Um, and when it comes to product standards, these are typically defined as either reusable or cloth, and then combined with the word sanitary pad, towel, or napkin. Now, there's two additional categories of reusable pads or products that are not menstrual cups, um, and those are intralabial pads and then period panties or period underwear. Now, these are less present in LMICs, which is the focus of today's conversation, but there are increasing, uh, there's increasing interest around them. So, while there's very little happening in standards so far for the latter two products, um, we will focus the majority of our discussion around reusable pads, but it's great today that we have Audrey here from Bee Girl to hopefully shed some light as well um, about period panties. 
Now, just as a general explanation, um, when it comes to the benefits of reusable menstrual health products in LMICs, um, the top three benefits are really the cost-saving element due to the reusable design, um, the environmental aspect in terms of reducing waste, which is particularly important in countries with limited or strained uh, waste infrastructure, and then convenience. Uh, which comes from the durability and reusability, and the fact that it's a single purchase, which is very important when we talk about access. And for the above reasons, um, reusable menstrual products can also be uh, interesting in humanitarian settings where they are both accepted and appropriate. Uh, that always needs to be evaluated because it's a case-by-case -case basis, um, but these three factors of cost-saving, eco-friendliness, and convenience can make them um, quite interesting and, and relevant. Uh, and that's also where I think standards and quality become quite important. So what we see is that there are many brands and types of reusable pads available on the market. Um, and that is increasingly the case in LMICs. But the question really comes to um, quality, safety, and conformity. Um, and are these in place, what exists due to the minimal levels of standardization that exist um, around the world thus far. And if you can jump to the next slide. Yeah. So what we know is that there is no one product fits all when it comes to metro health products. And a shared aim of MHM stakeholders is really to promote the use of safe and effective menstrual products. We see that this often involves a shift away from traditional methods and an increase in the use of commercial menstrual products um, or homemade menstrual products, but that have been designed to be a step above uh, traditional methods. And this is important because the use of safe and effective methods also requires that consumers are able to access and choose from a variety of products and that those products are of good quality and that they're deemed safe for use. And so in the absence of product standards, uh, we see a variety of things happening. Um, and so when we break that down and look first at manufacturers, what we can see is that without standards, manufacturers have no accountability. Um, there's nothing that enforces them to ensure that the quality or the safety of the products that they produce are in line with what is, uh, let's say, necessary for safety. When it comes to retailers or distributors or NGOs that are distributing products, we see that they can sell or distribute any MH products, uh, irrespective of their quality, their performance, durability, or any of those other key parameters. And so they may be doing um, doing that without even realizing that they're producing or that they're distributing substandard products. When it comes to government, we see that without standards, regulatory bodies have uh, limited frameworks for enforcing what products are on the market. And then ultimately, when it comes to consumers and beneficiaries, they really have inadequate protections and assurances about the quality and the safety and the fitness for perf purpose or function of the products that they're buying. So what we're, what we're largely seeing is that in LMICs, where possible, product standards can provide an important regulatory framework that goes hand in hand with supporting the menstrual health sector's, um, let's say, push to have increased access and choice when it comes to menstrual health products. And next slide. So what I'd like to do now is start to familiarize you with the parameters that are typically found in standards for reusable pads. So for those of you who tuned in to the first webinar on disposable pads, there will be some overlap here. Um, but of course, there also are some key distinctions and that's really what we want to flag today when it comes to reusable pads. So I will do a, a, an overview and then later on in today's discussion, uh, Torben will dive into more detail on some of the parameters that are really specific um, and important when we talk about reusable pads. So the content of a standard, it, typically there are about six sections of a standard, um, and this is the case for reusable pads. And so what we see is the section of general specifications is where the terms and the definitions are defined. And 
across most standards, what we see sanitary pads being described by is their absorbency capacity. And so a standard would provide uniform labeling terms that should be used by manufacturers. So examples of that would be the words like light pads or regular pads or super pads. And the objective here is straightforward. Um, by describing or labeling the pads according to their absorbency capacity, which is their key performance indicator, it makes it possible for consumers to identify and to purchase the type of pad that they need. So the pad that meets their absorbency requirements. And this is really the basis of informed consumer choice. Now, this general specification section of a standard would also define the material components and the qualities of the fabric, as well as often the construction of the pad. And in some cases, we see size being specified. So those would be the dimensions, although that is typically less important when compared to the absorbency. And so therefore, it's not really the defining labeling term. Now, the next section of a standard um, for reusable sanitary pads is typically the one about product and performance requirements. Now, this is important because these are the requirements as opposed to just specifications. And requirements are typically then linked with a test in the test methods section of that standard that are then tested against in order to make sure compliance is there. So these parameters are basically what ensure that the product is fit for purpose. So in other words, the pad does what we think it should do. Um, and again, this is where absorbency and retention capacity um, are one of the most important parameters. Um, I think it's important to say that a key distinction between disposable pad standards and reusable pad standards is that um, this, this categorization of absorbency capacity was first introduced in Africa in Uganda standard in 2017. And this was a way of holding manufacturers accountable for the differences in absorbency capacity based on their labeling claims. So for example, if a pad is indicated to be a, a super flow um, pad or for heavy flow versus a pad for regular flow, there should be a difference there in their absorbency capacity. And that claim should be able to be um, traced back and it tested against in a standard. So this is currently not seen in standards for disposable pads. Um, and so I think what is missing here and what would be uh, a great point of conversation later on in this dialogue is that there is an absence of universal terms or definitions for sanitary pads. What defines a pad to be a light pad versus a heavy pad versus a, a normal regular flow pad? Um, and what are the respective absorbency requirements that should be paired with those terminologies in order to make it easier for consumers to know what they're buying? Now. This section of product and performance requirements also includes very important hygiene uh, and microbiology parameters. Now, vaginal flora is very unique uh, and very susceptible to changes. And so it's essential to make sure that this is not harmed or negatively affected through the use of a particular sanitary product, whether that's a disposable pad, a reusable pad, a tampon, or a cup. And so what we see in standards for reusable sanitary pads is um, a couple of criteria and tests that are done to ensure that some base levels of hygiene are there. And so one of those tests is a total viable bacteria count on the pad, and the max level is 1,000 per gram of sanitary pad. We also see specific microbiological testing that's done for three types of bacteria. Those are enterobacteria, staphylococcus, and pseudomonas, which need to be absent from the pad. Uh, and we also see a test for pH where that is defined, acceptable pH levels are defined and tested against before a pad goes to market. Other key uh, product and performance indicators that are defined in a standard are related to durability, things like odor, drying time, and color fastness. And I know that Torben will talk more about that uh, later in today's discussion. When it comes to pack packaging and marking, um, these are the parameters that specify the type of packaging material that is uh, acceptable for the safe distribution and sale of the product and in order to keep that product uh, clean and hygienic. Um, it is interesting to note that most standards that exist for reusable sanitary pads require plastic packaging. And this is a 
bit of um, a clash when you talk about a more eco-friendly product and you're thinking um, about uh, plastic packaging. However, we do see that there is some importance to this in LMICs where um, product storage, transport and whatnot um, put the product at risk of damage. And, and so having it wrapped in plastic is currently a requirement in all standards. This section of a standard would also define the uh, marking on the packaging, which would include things like batch numbers, manufacture date, uh, the raw materials used in the product, the duration of wear, so the durability of the product, as well as the disposal instructions. Next slide, please. Great. Um, and so now, now moving into the last three sort of sections, or let's say chapters of a a standard for reusable sanitary pads. Sampling and testing. Um, now, this section is to provide the manufacturer with the guidelines for testing its products for conformity. So this ranges from the frequency and the scale of tests, because of course, not all uh, products coming out of a factory can be tested. So there are sampling methods that define how and which uh, quantity of products should be submitted for formal laboratory testing. Um, which results in what's called a certificate of conformity, which indicates that based on the random sampling done at that factory, that the products in that factory are in line with the standard parameters. Um, and there's also a definition of random versus mandatory testing, meaning that um, the standards bodies can come and do random sampling of your products, which is important um, for, again, conformity and compliance. And I think this is also a, an interesting discussion point later today, if possible, uh, in regards to small scale producers or DIY pad programs um, for whom batch testing of this nature um, could be quite prohibitive, but is also important in you know, ensuring that the products that are being produced are in line with basic uh, quality parameters. So the next section is the test methods and procedures. Now, these are all defined by the standard to ensure that there is uniformity in certification. And so the test methods are defined step by step. Uh, where possible, those test methods are derived from ISO test methods. And the importance here is that by having very specifically defined test methods, we know that whether a test is done in a different lab within a country or across different countries that happen to share a regional standard, that that test method is uh, uniform. But what we see is that there is actually quite a bit of variation in the different test methods that exist in the current standards out there for reusable sanitary pads, meaning the tests that are done in Tanzania might be different than the tests done in Zimbabwe. And so ideally, these would be streamlined with a harmonized Pan-African standard. And finally, some standards um, are limited. Most standards that we see actually out there are limited to the product itself. But other countries uh, include the manufacturing environment and provide some specifications on appropriate manufacturing. Um, for example, the factory requirements, um, conditions for the facilities and for the employees. And for example, we see that in the South African final draft standard and the Zimbabwe uh, existing standard for reusable sanitary pads. So together, these six uh, categories make up what are the typical parameters and the typical content for a standard for reusable sanitary pads. Uh, and again, Torben will, will jump more deeply into this uh, in the coming slides ahead. Thank you, Sophia, very much. That was really an um, interesting overview of different parameters. And I also thank you for highlighting where reusable products might have or might need a different type of uh, standard and, and quality control. Um, the next questions I would like to direct uh, to Torben, but I also ask Shivani to jump in um, if she wants to add something. Um, Given what Sophia said, uh, that there is a lack of standards and uh, we relieve supplies products to different countries, what standards are you using today? Um, what testing criteria do you apply? And we're also interested in to, in to understand what are the limitations um, to those uh, testing criteria looking at reusable products. 
and um, on what basis do you provide information to the users in, in terms of what we said in, on the packages, on the materials, usage, handling and drying. Over to you. Thanks, Ina. Um, oh, you went. Uh, you were going straight into my uh, my presentation. I can move back. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, no, I, I was I was just uh, uh, at, at least trying to uh, start answering the questions sure. before we go to my own slides. Um, so uh, basically, uh, with uh, with um, our manufacturing in in real relief, we have uh, two. Uh, Kind of two streams. One is uh, our uh, our centralized manufacturing, um, uh, where we have uh, three different plants that is, uh, is 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 manufacturing on on an industrial scale, and um, here we have set standards for uh, for size and for thickness and for solvency and these kind of things. So so we're doing that on a regular basis. Uh, uh, continuously in the production um, and of course every time there is a, a, a large shipment there will be uh, some sort of uh, pre-shipment inspection as well so there's uh, there's quite a number of tests involved in that um, and um, uh, we have uh, for for the other stream which is the small-scale manufacturing we have built a um, we, we have made a, a, a very very clear uh, SOP with uh, pictures and uh, with uh, different uh, um, <clears throat> parts of the process that needs to be uh, done according to certain standards. So we have some uh, some standards for the raw materials, which is uh, normally when we're talking a small scale manufacturing, we are supplying the raw materials ourselves to the to the to the um, to the to the small scale manufacturers, so uh, that's not a, a much of an issue. Uh, cutting uh, a lot of the times, we're actually uh, supplying cut cut material, so that it's only the assembly and the uh, stitching that is done at the local manufacturing. Then, how the uh, pad is supposed to be assembled, how it's supposed to be stitched, uh, how the bottom sub is supposed to be placed with uh, dimensions and everything on everything. Uh, which points needs to be checked, and then uh, finally something about how the product is uh, is uh, supposed to be packed. So there's an SOP there that we are supplying to any uh, small scale manufacturing. Um, I'll um, uh, skip the question number two because that's what I'm going to talk about in my own slides. Um, then um, for um, uh, information, uh, what basis we're providing information to the users. Of course, we're using the packaging to uh, uh, to um, uh, give uh, as much as uh, information as possible. And we're also supplying uh, an, an insert um uh, to uh, in in the packaging on 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 a lot of these issues and 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 many of these things has been uh, developed over time and also been developed uh, with uh, with field studies and on in in different uh, in different settings now uh, we we real relief is is a company that is uh, uh Found it within the humanitarian sector, so so we are mostly applying the uh, the safe path in uh, in emergency settings. So there's um, uh, we have done quite a number of field studies in that uh, region. Can we take the next slide, Ina? Yes, yeah, sure. One second. Thanks. So um, what? is necessary to cover in, um, in, in, in a standard for usable sanitary pads. So a lot of this is, is, is obvious things that need to be covered. And, and some of it is my opinion. So, you know, it's not a, this is not a, a carved in stone. This is uh, just, you know, uh, a, a, um, uh, a forum for discussion. So, uh, but I'll, uh, Try and 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 give my points uh, across so that uh, we can uh, potentially have a discussion uh, going going forward. So I I um I think there are four different things that are important when we're talking about a usable sanitary pad. 
so we 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 have an area of uh, chest relating to the durability absorbency of course that's what it needs to do uh, a very important one uh, is uh, the drying time and this, this is something that that has come out of uh, some of the field studies that we have done is how important actually drying time is um, because if the drying time of a pad is <clears throat> is too long <clears throat> uh, the effect is that uh, the women are starting to use pads before they're actually dry which gives uh, problems with uh, with skin irritation and, and and infections and 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 these kind of things so so it is actually uh, right up there with the others as as being extremely important, and and then safety, <clears throat> um, the safety of, of use of the pad. So when you're talking about durability, of course, the materials and the composition of the pad is uh, is something that uh, that needs to be uh, put uh, in attention of of a of a standard. Uh, there is, and, and to some extent, you can even argue that you should have uh, have have different standards for different materials. Because if you're talking about a polyester reusable sanitary pad, or you're talking about a cotton uh, reusable sanitary pads, there there are uh, there there is a difference uh, in what you can in what you can uh, can ask of the two different paths, uh, pads. That comes into the next point, which is a, a tensile strength. Now, I put tensile strength there, but it's not necessarily has to be tensile strength. It could be abrasion strength, which would probably be even better. The problem is that you don't have a standardized textile test, uh, to my knowledge, that uh, really gives a very good picture of, of, of what uh, abrasion does uh, in terms of uh, demanding, what, what uh, abrasion demands. in, in in terms of strength in the product, so but there is a number of tests that could be uh, that could be be looked into. It's 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 important because durability of a reusable sanitary pad is very important since it is uh, determined of uh, how cost effective the price is for the use of the product is for the user. It's 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 determined of how environmental friendly the product is uh, because it, it's determining the the lifetime of the product. Uh, and then uh, workmanship. I think workmanship is important because it, it says something about uh, how much is how 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 well is the uh, manufacturing site organized. It, it is is completely uh, um, straight. Uh, you see it straight on on the workmanship whether you are working with a good uh, organized uh, manufacturing site. Absorbency. Uh, so the Tanzanians and the U Ugandan standards are, are using the same basic test, which is, which in my opinion is a good one. So you're basically dripping um, uh, a uh, liquid onto the, the pad and see how well it uh, it um, it absorbs it, uh, and then you put a one kilo load on the on the pad, and then you see um, after. Um, a, a period of time, uh, whether there has been any leakage uh, on the backside of the pad. Now that brings into the question: Is this actually an an, an, an absorbency test, or is it, is it a leakage test? Uh, because the uh, the amount of liquid that you put into the pad is already predefined by the standard, and and then you're looking at what happens if you put a one kilo load on it. In that respect, it is actually a leakage test. Not as as not as much as 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 uh, an absorbency test. Now, if you want to check how much is actually absorbed, you would probably need to do other tests. Um, and um, there are there is a number of uh, of 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 other tests that could be considered. Uh, I mentioned uh, two of them them here. Um, what should be uh, consider should be in, in my opinion, you should uh, you should uh, look into is whether you want to test just the absorbent layer in the in in in, in the pad, or you want to check the whole pad. And in that respect, the um, absorbency test use, uh, chosen by uh, Tanzania and Uganda is 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 is, is better. Uh, but you could argue that you might want to take it a bit further, so that you also Use the same test, but then find some way of checking how uh, how much can you actually absorb? Can the individual pad actually absorb 
Um, so that, that is uh, something that is missing, in my opinion, in the Tanzanian and Ugandan standard. The drying time, yeah, well, there is an ISO, ISO test that is a little bit complicated. You could also make it a simple test. So basically wetting a, a, a pad and then um, uh, drying it on, 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 on hang drying it and then uh, uh, weighing it uh, over a period of time until it reaches its original weight and then it would be dry. Uh, so that would be a simple one, but I, I haven't seen the drying. I'm actually been part of the, um, that, that any standard has actually put drying time it might be, I, I haven't seen all the standards. So, but I haven't seen it. I've seen that they have put up, um, there has put up limits for drying time, but but no test has been put uh, uh, to to uh, to actually check it. Um, and 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 a general factor is if if you put something into a standard, you should be able to check it. Otherwise, it's 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 nonsense. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, safety, uh, obviously, pH value, which uh, Sophia also mentioned, is of course is very important. It's a it's sensitive area where these products are going to be used. Bio burden, that's something that I'm putting. I, I have taken uh, separately in the next slide the issue, and then other uh, other residue uh, residues. Um, so I've I've seen standards that has been looking at a lot of residues. So all might be. That that might be harmful to the human body, um, and and you know that could be interesting to see if the product contains azodiase and this and that, but it also uh, makes the standards quite uh, difficult to uh, to work with, and it 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 would become expensive to test the products, which again will put a quite a burden on especially smaller manufacturers. Okay, next slide, please. So bio burden. Now, bio burden. When you're talking about a disposable pad, that that's clear. Uh, you take you you have a product that's supposed to be used once, so bio burden is clear. Now, now we have a pad that is supposed to be used maybe I don't know hundred times. Um, and um, does it then really matter that that whether there is a small bio burden on on in in in, in the in the virgin product? Uh, since the product is being used again and again and again and again, so the, the question of bio burden is more a question of how do you actually take care of your product? Because this already is the second time you use the product, it's no longer um, uh, the res responsibility of the manufacturer to make sure that you don't have too high bio burden in the, uh, in, 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 in the product. Um, but of course, the other thing is, can we avoid having something uh, bio, uh, ha having some standard for bio bird? Uh, because you know we we are we are dealing with authorities that has to approve a product that is being used uh, directly against the skin. So that's another question. But you know, it's, I don't have the definite answer. But it's this is this is more like a question to the uh, to the plenum. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, we also need to take into consideration is that if you have a product that is claiming antimicrobial, uh, it's claiming to be antimicrobial, um, then then um, then uh, we should actually have uh, a optional test uh, to uh, check whether this claim is actually uh, is actually uh, validated. Um, and and there are some tests there that is uh, interesting, which is the AATCC 100 and the uh, Japanese standard JISL 1902. Both of them uh, is very able to uh, to show um, the um, uh, the antimicrobial ability of a fabric. Yes, last last slide, please. And then there is a number of other tests. I put it here because I think these are uh less vital uh to some extent i think they 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 are uh, it's not necessary um so um uh, size of the product do we really care how what is the size of the product if it if it does what it has to do why should we put up uh, um uh, uh, standards for sizes you know some of the products that we're talking about is in the form of of, of panties some of them are 
uh, inserts in, in, in some sort of uh, uh, silicone uh, uh, holder or something else, you know. So how can we make, uh, how, it, it will make the standard complicated if we start doing that. Odor, yes, but it's again, it's, it's, the, it's the virgin product we're talking about. And, and odor is also something that is very subjective. Uh, who has to? Who who is deciding what an odor is? And you you can't really put a standard to it. The design of the path goes with the same argument as the size. Do we really need to uh, put standards for how the pad is designed? Color fastness, rubbing fastness, washing. Yeah, well, um, it's 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 non-essential uh, as uh, in 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 terms of of the the the, the actual. Uh, feasibility of the product, uh, the, how the product uh, functioning. So, the, do we need it? Abrasion resistance. That was, what was I was talking about. Maybe putting that as a as as a strength test might be interesting. Water soluble matter. It's the same thing as 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 uh, what the other materials. It's a safety question. But at least you should, uh, if you want to check uh, water soluble matter, you should at least uh, uh, make the extraction with water, not with ethanol, as the um, new Ethiopian standard is suggesting. Um, so um, these are just tests that is um, that that is optional in 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 a um, in a standard. So I think that's uh, probably concludes what I wanted to say. Thank you, Torben. I think that uh, was very comprehensive, also from a perspective of a company how you deal with multiple standards um and how you see that i before i turn like shivani do you uh, want to add something on your perspective do you want to challenge torben or do you have a similar opinion uh no i do actually agree with uh pretty much most of what torben has been saying uh just a few points really that i wanted to highlight um one is that you know what all manufacturers do is they have a responsibility to test the product up to a certain level and um that's how the product needs to be when it's bought by the consumer everything that happens after that is really up to the consumer so the second big responsibility for a manufacturer is to make sure you know you give enough information on that leaflet or on the box that gives them the instructions on how to treat their product um and you know when we started out uh living guard has been working with um softkins as the brand for a few years now and when we started out there was no um standard in india that looked at reusable sanitary napkins so we kind of you know spoke to experts in textiles we spoke to uh we looked at what other standards were out there for reusable products um and you know we really tried to create a list of what tests we thought were applicable uh, it just so happens that those are exactly the same tests um, that are now in the Indian um, draft standard that we're looking at. But, you know, there are certain things that we need to stay, that we need to keep uh, in mind when making these uh, reusable products. One is, you know, what is the, the textile that you're using? Where did you source it from? Is it, uh, you know, Ecotex certified or... Um, you know, what is the material safety of the dye stuffs used um, on the product? Because at the end of the day, all of this will affect uh, skin sensitization. Um, there's again a lot of question on whether the existing protocols for skin safety, cytotoxicity are as effective uh, as they should be, but there has to be some, uh, you know, uh, lowest common denominator with which we have to go. Uh, look at product safety. What are the regulatory requirements? I know that this will be something that Real Relief and Living Guard have to look at really carefully because we have antimicrobial treatments on our products. And so, you know, are the chemicals you're using uh, actually safe for skin contact? Uh, within each country, there are different uh, regulatory requirements. So, are we actually uh, upholding those regulatory needs? Uh, what about you know, are any of the dyes or chemicals or treatments for, say, quick drying or things like that, uh, leaching from the, the product after every wash? Uh, and then that begs the question of, do we test all the, um, do we test a product just one time or do we create a washing protocol and repeat the tests for the number of times we claim that the product can be used for? 
Um, so with Safkins, that's something that we did do, where we said that okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna tell people that it can be used for one year, which is about 60 to 70 washes, then have we tested that its absorbency, um, you know, its antimicrobial efficacy um, is all maintained for this period of time. And then we have to make sure that whatever the wash protocol is that we are suggesting to the end user is the wash protocol that is used, um, you know, for the actual product. And, um, you know, like Torben said that, um, you know, there there could be a huge requirement for having a drying test, but then how do you control the humidity and the temperature um, mm -hmm. to make sure that a pad that dries in India in say 15 minutes or one day uh, will take the same amount of time to dry in Tanzania or in another geography. And that's where, um, you know, just trying to come, do come down to what the bare minimum is that we need to test for um becomes important and i cannot stress enough that um i agree with torben when he says that if you're making a claim uh, on your product then it needs to be verified with some sort of test and we're seeing this more and more in india i'm not too sure about what the case is in africa but people are claiming to be you know using bamboo so they're anti-microbial uh, or they're using a uh, certain you know raw materials so they're claiming to be 100 percent biodegradable or compostable these are all like, um, you know, claims that are extremely strong consumer claims and a consumer sees that they take it at face value. Uh, but has it been verified by anybody? Is it being, uh, you know, checked? And if it turns out that it's not true, then is someone stopping that company from making um, claims uh, in the open market? And we're seeing so many um, of these small scale enterprises making pads and uh, then the question becomes do they really need to go for the same um you know standard approval or is it something that uh you know they can do a kind of a more uh like a a, a slightly lower end uh version of that uh it, it's a question and it's a little tough and there's been a lot of back and forth i know on the panel that we have in india creating the standard but uh it is kind of at least an effort that we're making now to go towards that. Um, and I just had one last point about the question of design. I completely agree that I don't think the design should be something um, that we have very formalized in our standards because that kind of stands, uh, like it kind of stands in the way for innovation. Uh, if companies don't think that they can design new shapes or new you know, product types to, to deal with something because it wouldn't get uh, approval within the standard or, or wouldn't fall under the purview of the standard that could actually stop them from coming up with a solution that could do a lot better than any of the solutions we have out there right now. So, you know, we need to make it conducive to, um, for people to innovate. Yeah, absolutely. I think innovation especially was for Reusable products, one of the key criteria. Um, Shivani, thank you for your input. I pulled up the questions, um, which you partly answered, but I also am reaching out to Torben and Audrey. Um, we said when you started out, there was no standard. So what are, about um, where can a company look for information on standards when you develop a new product? And um, I also know that you, kind of established a standard operation procedure what what do you include in there um, yeah so uh, when we started out we actually spoke to someone from the department of um, you know science and technology in the government then we also reached out to the um, ICMR, which is the Indian Council of Medical Research um, we, re we reached out to the health and family welfare department and then we looked at what, um, you know, we had to go online and see what are the other products out there that are reusable, what are the kind of claims they're making, um, and then how do you verify this claim? Uh, coming from kind of a biotechnology company that develops uh, hygiene technologies and solutions, uh, we approached the entire thing with a lot more of the, let's make sure we have the science right, and then work on product design once we have the fabrics and things like that. Um, but it is difficult and now we've reached a point where you know because we're in the game of treating textiles and doing that we have an sop when it comes to 
how regularly do we need to do retesting? Uh, are we checking to see that the raw materials that we're getting um, still meet the standard? Are they testing um, you know, their product or do we need to test the product that they are sending us? Um, and it is expensive and it, is, um, it isn't very easy to do, but it's something that if you want to you know, play in the big leagues to an extent, if you want to be a consumer product, uh, then you have that responsibility as a company to um, ensure that whatever is being sold to a consumer um, is something that can use. And this actually brings in another question of, um, you know, depending on the workmanship, uh, do you tell the consumer that they need to wash the product before they use it the first time? Is that being, in, like, are they being informed? Um, and if so, are they really doing it? Because that begs the question of, you know, what happens if there is, like, bacterial contamination on an unused product? And whose fault does that become? Thanks. Um, I'm in, I'm conscious a little bit about the time, so I would turn over to B Girl because we talked a lot about pads, but um, uh, period underwear, period panties do also for. Uh, I want to cover this also, and Audrey, so can you explain us a little bit what where, which type of standard day menstrual underwear fall, or which do you use? I know, for example, in U in US the it's been quite tricky because there's been uh, standards for pads and tampons and caps, but maybe not for panties. And uh, I know that you work in other countries. And how do you how how is the, how is that journey of the um, peer, uh, period panty standard? Um, and the second question for you, I mean, uh, there have been some concerns about finding. So I've, I've used an abbreviation and I can't access it, but some, some uh, in in certain brands of period panties, so not B girls. Um, and here we come to what was raised before on the type of materials being used, how they are um, uh, treated for antifungal, antimicrobiological, and there have been um, yeah certain brands who had too high rates. Um, and I know it's bad to put you on the spot, but maybe you can also um, explain a little bit um, about this discussion. Absolutely, thanks so much. Uh, just a bit of an intro. I, so B Girl is a social enterprise and we offer a line of sustainable period products. And so that does include washable pads as well as menstrual cups with sterilizing cases. But what I'll be speaking about most today is our menstrual underwear. And there's a couple of different kinds of period underwear. A lot of the existing ones, at least in the US and the UK, they use a design that uses, so of course, uh, just a regular pair of underwear and they have a absorbent, uh, thick layers of absorbent material in the bottom of it. And so it's essentially just an absorbent that's built into the underwear. And B-Girl uses a different design. So we have our own patented design, which is a pocket. So it's a leak-proof pocket that has a layer on the bottom that does not allow water to pass through. And then there's a mesh pocket and we insert absorbent material. So either a towel that can be folded and inserted or a pad that can be inserted into the bottom um, or whatever choice the user has. And so um, we've had users who use disposable inserts such as toilet tissue or cotton that can be inserted and then disposed of. And so this allows a bit more flexibility and it also allows more absorbency compared to those thick layers of material. And so talking a bit more about the standards and, and what they fall under. So period underwear is a bit different because it falls under the standards for apparel, just like any other underwear in most cases. And so the standards that exist, they're subject to standards such as, of course, size and fit. Um, and on one hand, this certainly has advantages to it. It can make product import much, much easier. It allows more flexibility in the design. And we, we've also found that there's, there's less stigma in general around menstrual underwear than pads because pads are recognized easily as period products. Um, both in the gatekeepers that we work with as also girls themselves. Um, however, of course, this does mean that quality then is in very much in the hands of the suppliers, and that can that can certainly come with its risks as well. So at, at B-Girl, we use the same standards for our menstrual underwear that we use for our washable pads. 
And that includes, of course, absorbency, the amount of water to wash, the drying time, the durability. And, and then ideally, it would be the case, of course, that period underwear meets the same levels of quality standards as the pads do. So, um, of course, including sizing as well for the underwear. Uh, right now, B-Girl is one of the only suppliers of period underwear in LMICs, but of course this could certainly change. And so it's important that, that our standards for any sort of menstrual absorbance are, are meeting the same levels of, of quality that the pads would be meeting as well. And then, and, and a, a good example of this, of course, is with the concerns about the PFAs. So uh, just a bit of background, there was some news that's that's come out relatively recently that some of the, the leading brands of period underwear in, in the US were using, were found to have significant levels of PFAs in them. PFAs are a, a substance that's commonly used in waterproofing as well as with other treatment of fabrics, um, but it's been connected to adverse health effects. So anything from increased risks of cancer to increased re reproductive problems. And, uh, and so a lot of the companies of course have denied that PFAs were intentionally added and this potentially speaks to supply chain management, of course the need to, to retest products and ensure quality, but also the, just the need for increased standards when it comes to period underwear beyond just that which would be applied to traditional underwear. And then, and, and so of course these, these lax, these somewhat more lax standards, this is of course the danger that can come with, uh, that can come along with them. And, and to speak to the, the antimicrobial aspect, there's, you know, there's a couple of different ways that products can be made more antimicrobial. It's not necessarily an on or off switch. And so the treatment with chemicals is one. And so of, of course, treating products with a chemical that fights infection and fights bacteria can be one, one way to make a product antimicrobial. However, the material can also be a different way. And, and this is the, the route that B-Girl has taken is that we, we don't treat our products with any chemicals, but the material that we use is a, a high performance sports fabric that dries very, very, very quickly. And so it, it does not allow much time for bacteria to grow. And this, of course, it, it, it's, that's a, it, the need for tests in order to understand what is meeting certain levels of antimicrobial to be able to make that claim. We don't make that claim on our website or in the in the materials that we use, but there's there's certainly a need for not only having these standards, but also m more creative ways to ensure that a product is essentially inherently antimicrobial um, versus just treating a product with PFAs as well. And, and then I'll also just add, there's these standards for period underwear and the, the fact that this, this news has come out recently about the PFAs is, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we can all, of course, uh, agree that the, that, these, that the harmful substances is, is absolutely should be avoided and there should be standards that should be preventing this. But as, as we are all, and I'll, I'll speak as colleagues, as we're seeking to make sustainable period products more mainstream, news of these failures of standards, particularly in relatively new products, can make it much more difficult to continue pushing forward the advocacy efforts to make sustainable products more available to, um, to the broader public and also to pass certain standards and to make them more acceptable. And so we, of course, see certain cases where um, reusable products are outright rejected and that um, I, I, it's it's just disheartening in the work that we're doing. And so this is more, of course, my opinion as opposed to uh, 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 the actual facts, but there's it, this speaks to the need for these standards in order to protect the, the work that we're all doing to try to make these products more mainstream as we move forward. And you've and thank you. So you've moved on to the uh, the next slide here. And so I wanted to to chat just briefly and take just a very brief break from talking about standards to share just a few results from a study that Beagle recently published on products impact. And because of course this is the reason why we're, why we're all here, why we're seeking to make these products more available and more mainstream. And so we're hoping that this study will help to make the case for inclusion of menstrual products in more relief and development programs based on, based on the social impact and the social need. So just briefly, we, Bigo recently completed a study. It's in two provinces in Mozambique and we're testing effectiveness of our period underwear 
along with a menstrual education approach. And so we tested groups that received, groups of girls that received both education and period underwear versus groups that received just education versus comparison groups. And so I wanted to share some of the significant findings that we had between the group that received period underwear and education compared to the group that received just education. So the study revealed that these findings were, were because of the products themselves, that, that the education did not was not a factor. And what we found is a significant increase in girls' reported mobility. So we were looking not just at participation in school, school attendance, but we we're looking at overall mobility, ability to participate in activities such as sports or playing with friends, opportunities to build social capital, which have far further reaching consequences on girls' health, on their economic development throughout their lives, and a, a huge range of well-being outcomes. And, and so we saw significant increases in girls' reported mobility compared to the group that just received menstrual education. We saw a significant increase in their participation in, in social activities, so sports or playing with friends. And then also a significant increase in girls who reported feeling normal. And so this was an interesting finding because we were looking at how do girls feel during menstruation? And so there were optional answers such as, I feel scared or embarrassed or confident or just normal. And so the one significant increase that we saw was in girls who just said they felt normal after they had the products. And this is compared to girls who received menstrual education. And there was a significant increase in that group with regards to confidence, which we found that to be an interesting distinction is that products can help you essentially just feel normal during menstruation um, versus understanding how your body works can help to increase that feeling of confidence during menstruation as well. So we wanted to share this. this um, these results are available on the website. Happy to um, answer any questions about it as well. Um, but wanted to share this because we're what, of course, we're all seeking to do is make the case for inclusion of products in, in our efforts in order to, to meet needs during menstruation. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Audrey. Uh, and also sharing the perspectives. And I think that was really valuable because uh, that you mentioned that uh, period panties uh, sometimes do fall in a different category with all that. So, and then a clear call that they need to have a clear standard similar to reusables. Talking mm -hmm. about standards, I'm handing over to Sophia again. Um, who, because we talked about different standards and she looked at different available standards and also what the variations in parameters um very interesting comparison also if you look at the date when they've been released so over to you sophia great thanks so much um so i think what's really interesting and and exciting is is we we do see this growing push and movement and and support towards um more inclusive products and to go beyond just disposable pads as the product available on the market in LMICs to this growing range. Um, and that, that is so important when we talk about access, affordability, um, environmental impact, uh, and the like. And so what we'd like to do now is just um, give an overview of the existing standards or the standards in development for reusable sanitary pads. Um, this overview is uh, we hope comprehensive, but we are sure that there must be some gaps there, and we would love any information if any of the participants here have any information, especially outside of Africa. Um, and again, it's largely focused on reusable sanitary pads, given the lack of, um, let's say, momentum when it comes to standards for period panties or things like uh, intralabial pads. So. Africa has the most uh, volume of, of standards. We currently have five countries with a standard in place and one in the pipeline. Um, so that's Tanzania, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Ethiopia, and South Africa's uh, standard is in the final stages and should be passed within the coming months uh, if all goes uh, go smoothly. And what we see is that all of these standards were developed since 2014 um, and that the concentration of let's say progress is in East and Southern Africa. There are no known standards for reusable sanitary pads to date in Western or Northern Africa. Um, most of these standards cover the same basic parameters, those six sort of 
chapters that I described earlier in today's discussion. Um, and But we do see some variation across um, across the standards in terms of the content or the requirements within those specific parameters. And so I've tried to outline what some of those are. Um, I do think that the biggest uh, fluctuation or variation across standards comes with um, the labeling. So how do we call pads? Do we call them um, light, heavy, regular? Um, do we include maternity pads or not? Do we include panty liners or not? Um, and so what is that sort of spectrum of, um, of products? And again, what are the observancy requirements that we associate with those different pads? And why this is really important is uh, in terms of mass manufacturing or industrial manufacturing is uh, import and export and trade. Uh, because when you have different requirements at different um, national levels, it makes it very difficult to make a single product that you can then um, sell or export across the country. And when we look towards scaling up the availability of these types of products, that becomes quite important. Um, in all of these national standards, uh, reusable sanitary pads fall under the category of textiles, um, and they are then handled by a technical committee under the textiles category. Um, for the most part, these are considered non-medical textiles, uh, but in some countries we know that they, um, that they could be categorized under medical textiles. And that also brings you know, an interesting discussion point as to whether these products should be considered medical or non-medical products. Um, and there is that to consider in, in the actual use of the product, um, the medicalization of something like periods, but simultaneously, uh, it needs to be considered in the waste stream. Um, reusable pads are ideally washed before they're disposed of. Um, but if they're not washed, for example, a disposable pad, then is that waste considered medical waste, uh, biomedical waste? How is it really categorized? So that's all just you know interesting discussion points if, if we have time and get to it. Um, all of these standards at the national level in Africa um, are voluntary standards. Uh, Uganda is the one with a mandatory standard, and it's possible that the South Africa standard will also be deemed a mandatory standard. Um, and so that is also uh, an important consideration. And I think what is important here is that while these various products are found in numerous countries across Africa, um, the next aspect of having a standard is actual enforcement and compliance. If you could go to the next slide, please. So when we look at regional standards, again, um, we're going to talk about Africa here because that is where we, we have standards coming up. Um, the East African community is a trade region of six member countries, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan. Um, and so the East Africa Standards Committee has developed a final draft standard uh, in 2019 um, but this standard now needs to go through the final steps of the process in order to actually be put into place. And that has not happened. Um, and there is a bit of um, a disagreement here on the harmonization of the standard with Kenya and Rwanda not yet moving forward with it. Um, if that does go into effect at some point in the future, then what it would mean is that the national level standards uh, within these countries would be secondary to the East African harmonized standard. And again, here the intention and objective is uh, ease of trade uh, and streamlined uh, uniformity in manufacturing, um, not to stifle innovation, but rather to ensure that we demand the same requirements in terms of key performance and fitness for purpose across these countries. Now, ARSO is the African Organization for Standardization. It's an organization with 36 member countries and it has the goal of harmonizing Pan-African standards, again, to ease and uh, enhance uh, trade on the continent. Now, a promising 2019 development is that ARSO moved its draft standard from uh, a working draft level to a final draft standard. Uh, they've done this for both reusable pads and disposable pads. And so this is something that could really change the pace and the scale of progress on standards on the continent. Um, because if it is approved, it would allow countries that have not 
drafted a national standard to bypass that step and to instead adopt this Pan-African standard. Uh, it is not mandatory for countries to do that, but certainly it could uh, bypass the process and the cost of having a national standard. And again, uh, create a, a harmonized uh, approach to, to the product. If you could go to the next slide, please. So outside of Africa, there is very little um, progress, or at least uh, we are aware of very little progress. Um, what we see in India is that there is a final draft standard in place. The, the Menstrual Health Alliance of India, um, who is one of the uh, leaders of this webinar series, has been heavily involved in that. And so that draft standard um, would hopefully come out at some point in 2020. Um, and I think one interesting thing to note is to date, that is the only standard that includes any reference to antibacterial properties. Um, and I believe that's largely to do with two of the speakers who are participating today, uh, Torbin from Real Relief and um, Shivani from uh, Living Guard, uh, because they both are working on, on products that have an antibacterial treatment uh, and property. Then in the United States, of course, not an LMIC, but just a, uh, an interesting data point is that the US FDA does have um, a pre-market notification for um, menstrual tampons and pads. Um, that includes disposable pads, tampons, and cloth pads, as well as interlabial pads. Um, and these products by the FDA are classified as um, NSR medical devices, so non-significant risk medical devices, which again brings up that discussion point of are pads uh, and specifically reusable pads uh, worthy of being considered medical devices or not. Um, there, there are reasons on, on both sides of the argument there. And what we know is that at the um, ISO level, which is the International Standards Organization, um, this was mentioned by Louise in the in the first webinar, is that there there is a discussion with Sweden uh, working towards developing ISO standards for all categories of menstrual health products. So that is something to have on the radar and to see how that unfolds in in the time ahead. Um, and again, if anyone has any information uh, to add to these tables, it's most welcome. Uh, specifically, we are not aware of any other uh, standards in place in South Asia or Latin or South America, whether in place or under development. So please let us know uh, if you're aware of anything so that we, we try to have a complete resource here available to all of our participants. Thank you, Sophia. So initially we had questions to Mahesh. Um, I'm just uh, pulling out now what he mentioned for the South African standard. So it's almost in the finalization stage. Um, it's all about the choice of women uh, doesn't uh, in the sanitary dignity framework, which is the policy that they refer to. And yeah, so they have really recommended what proper care instruction and statements are clearly marked. I think that is one of um, the key requirements. Um, next to absorbency pH, microbiological aspects, loss of fibers, um, which is, I found, an interesting element. Um, we wanted to close with some gaps and challenges also, Sophia, by, that you want to highlight, and then we open up for some questions um, from, the, from the chat box. Yeah, great. So I think that when we discuss standards, um, it's important to understand what makes up a standard, what are those parameters, and some of the discussion around, um, let's say, how do we make sure that standards ensure products are safe, yet also leaving room for innovation. But having a standard is, uh, is I'd say, one step of the process. Um, and it's certainly not enough to just develop a standard. Um, if standards are considered a priority and uh, important to have, then compliance, uh, certification, and enforcement are essential. And you heard Shivani mentioning this as well, uh, Torben also, when a company makes claims, are those claims then verified um, in order to make sure that we have the consumer's safety and best interest in mind? And so in many countries, what we see is that these uh, these gaps can be as big or as significant as a complete absence of standards. 
uh, because the standard that isn't enforced is, uh, is not really serving a purpose. So all of this requires that there is public and private sector interest, uh, resources, capacity, and also commitment. Um, so when we talk about de developing standards, uh, MHM stakeholders need to recognize that as much as we want standards to be developed um, for the entire range of mental health products, standards bureaus don't have the capacity to develop unlimited numbers of standards every year. Standards development organizations are resource constrained and they do need to prioritize the standards that they work on. And in addition to just developing standards, standards also need to be reviewed and maintained and updated. So most of the standards that exist for reusable sanitary pads are first editions. Um, technically, they need to be reviewed every five or 10 years, depending on the standards body. Um, but what we see, of course, is that as we develop knowledge and understanding about what a standard for reusable pads look like, um, we see that a standard that may have been developed one or two years ago could already need updating, but many of these standards bodies, especially in LMICs, do not have the resources and capacity to do that. So it raises a question of, you know, is a standard good enough? Um, and therefore we develop it, we push it through uh, to have it in place rather than waiting for the perfect standard. Um, so again, uh, an interesting discussion point. Now, when it comes to, um, to testing and inspecting and certifying products, these tests need to be timely. So for example, we need to make sure that if it takes uh, if it takes two months for a manufacturer to receive the results of their tests, so their certificates of conformity, due to a country having insufficient testing facilities or an overburden of products to be tested, then a manufacturer's stock could already be sold or perhaps expired by the time that you know test results come out. Now, expiry with reusable products luckily is not an issue but certainly the risk of them being sold before even receiving the test results is an issue. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So what are the labs that exist? Are they certified? Are they well-equipped? Are there sufficient labs? Are there qualified lab technicians? Can they execute all of the tests that are actually outlined in the standard to be done? And can we get timely lab results? Then when it comes to enforcement and compliance, this is a cross-cutting issue. Now, of course, manufacturers need to comply with the certification and the testing requirements. So for example, certifying your product once is not enough. Um, there are lot and sampling requirements defined in the standard that indicate the frequency and scope and scale of testing. And so this is the burden of the manufacturer and the responsibility of the manufacturer. Um, it also raises the question as to the capacity of small-scale producers to, to meet these requirements. When it comes to retailers, um, if they are being required to only stock certified products, then that also requires enforcement and often is not the case. Um, when it comes to distributors, that's the same, the same issue there. And then when it comes to NGOs who are very big players in LMICs when it comes to mental health programs, um, if standards are important and if in a country they are actually mandatory, then this needs to be, um, they need to be aware of this in their own procurement and uh, distribution policies and processes. Uh, if an NGO is not aware, then they could be purchasing products that are not standardized um, yet the, there are rules and regulations around that. So again, how do we also distribute information about standards? Which is tricky because standards are actually um, published documents that need to be purchased. So to access a standard, what you actually do is you go to the website of that national standard authority, you select the standard that you would like to purchase and you purchase it online. Um, then that standard is licensed directly to you and is not meant to be shared. So how do we uh, effectively distribute information about standards um, when there is also this licensing and um, process in order to even gain access to that information? Um, so, so communication as well is quite important. And then just to leave it on the point of innovation, uh, again, Shivani, um, you mentioned this, as did Torben, which is uh, a standard that gets too 
detailed, too complex, and too limiting uh, really blocks the path for innovation. Um, there can be best practices that are recommended in terms of types of materials that are known to be um, ideal for this type of product, as an example, but limiting to only those types of products or materials would actually then stifle innovation. Um, and so, so that is, let's say, a type rope walk that needs to be done when developing standards, and, and it really uh, is at risk of, of being stifled if, uh, if, if that space is not left open. So uh, again, to achieve all of this, um, standards bureaus uh, and standard development organizations and the regulatory agencies that are, are tasked with enforcing standards really need to be um, adequately resourced and they need to be accountable and transparent. Um, and what we know is that developing standards is step one of the process, um, but it really is um, a, a life cycle approach as well, and that needs to be considered. Thank you. I completely agree with your last words. <laughs> That's a good closing. Um, moving on to Tanya and Arundhati, I, because I can't access the chat box. Um, do, I, is there interesting discussion questions that you want to pull out or give people opportunity to, to ask? Sure. Uh, so there is a question from Miles uh, taking from the concluding point uh, on is anyone working on product end uh, of life testing or recommendations? For example, how do reusable products perform under landfill disposal or incineration and combustion? And uh, any of the presenters, if you have thoughts, if you've had experiences in terms of disposal of products, uh, please It'd be good to hear. Okay. Um, seems like that's actually a gap and uh, maybe something to look at in terms of uh, further research and engagement with uh, donors as well. I, 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 There's I another can, question. I can, I can say a few words if you want, uh, if, if not just to leave the, 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 the question hanging in the air. Uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is a difficult uh, uh, question, you know, um, the thing about reusable sanitary pads is that uh, uh, depending, of course, on uh, how much durability uh, you have, uh, actually have with the product, you are uh, reducing the waste as compared to disposable pads with, uh, with, with uh, something like 99%. So already there, you have a huge environmental uh, impact. Um, but that, of course, still leaves the product there. The thing is that uh, depending on what material you're using, you're, you're, you're basically leaving a, a, a product uh, that is comparable to uh, any other piece of uh, apparel. So be it a, a polyester, well, a polyester uh, dress would be have the same challenge as a uh, sanitary pad made out of, of, of polyester or a cotton. Yeah, a cotton shirt would have the same uh, problem as a, a sanitary pad. So I, 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 uh, one needs to look at the scope of the, 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 the problem as well. Uh, having said that, of course, it's, it's interesting uh, uh, to look into. There are technologies out there that could be potentially be, be used, though it would need to be with uh, caution, something like uh, for synthetic materials, it could be oxobiodegradable uh, um, uh, materials being used um, uh, for, for for cotton. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I don't necessarily see cotton as a big problem because it's a, it's a, it's it's a natural uh, natural product. The, the thing about cotton is that the ninety nine percent waste reduction is probably not. Uh, uh, is not the case when you're talking about cotton because it would not be as durable. Um, but you know, these are the kind of things that you would uh, need to consider. But at the end of the day, we're talking about an apparel product and, 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 and the amount of products that we're talking about is extremely small as compared to all the other apparel products out there. Uh, but it's something that, 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 that should be considered as well. And, 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 and we as a company are constantly thinking about how we could potentially make it uh, more even more envi environmental friendly. 
but it's just that biodegradability and durability is kind of like the two uh, uh, opposites in 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 in, in this um, in, in this issue. Yeah, that's I oh. think that's it. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that I think it's interesting that this data point would also be useful in making the case for reusables because often advocacy for reusable products is based on the comparative environmental impact, uh, you know, with respect to disposable products. So a comparative assessment of the life cycle um, impact of both products uh, and obviously including the disposal impact would definitely help market development for reusable products, but I don't think it exists as of now. Um, uh, going to the next question, uh, so Jennifer uh, Gassner asks, uh, does any reusable product need to be registered in each country as a medical device, therefore restricting import until approval? Hi, this is Audrey. Audrey. Yeah. Hey, hi, I'll add, so we menstrual cups often do need to be registered as medical devices and this has been one of the the challenges that we faced to global import but it also of course makes perfect sense given that the menstrual cup is inserted in the body and does come with a, a higher risk than a menstrual absorbent like a pad or the underwear um, we found that the pads sometimes have to be registered as medical devices depending on the country um, we have not yet faced the need to register period underwear as medical devices anywhere again because they're they're typically imported as the classification of apparel so the, the response is menstrual cups yes typically pads sometimes and menstrual underwear not yet in our experience um, we we haven't faced uh, being uh, uh, faced a, a, a need to register a safe pad as a medical device yet uh, I know for a fact that the Indian government has uh, has specified it as a non uh, a, a non medical device um, and and since uh, the country of origin of SafePad is India, that's that's uh, um, um, yeah. Um, so we we haven't we haven't run into uh, to to any country uh, demanding uh, um, us to register uh, SafePad as a uh, a medical device. The closest we have been to that is Nigeria, where you have the NAFTAC uh, registration. Um, which basically registers any product uh, that you have to send in uh, to the country, uh, but but not particularly a medical device, no. Yeah, similarly, we haven't uh, faced that anywhere. If anything, the country might have regulations in place about, uh, you know, what you're allowed to make claims about in the open market, um, USA being one of them, if you're making claims for antimicrobial performance, but there's never been um you know a requirement to register the product uh, i did want to point out one thing though that in india the standard uh, the draft standard in place does classify period panties also um under the entire scope of the document yeah however not mandatory uh, yeah. and i'll uh, ask uh, uh, this brings me to the next question um, which shamira has asked Maybe the last question because it's uh, we're running close to to the end of the webinar. Sure, uh, Shamira asks, uh, in, and this is directed towards Sophia from uh, so for AfriPads, how have you ensured standards are enforced? Because here in Uganda, it's a problem, and local manufacturers are making products that are not standardized and putting them on the market, which is affecting reproductive health. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, let's say in Uganda specifically, um, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards, UNBS, is the one that is responsible for both developing standards and monitoring and compliance of standards. Um, now, effective March 2019, uh, a large number of standards moved from voluntary to compulsory or mandatory standards, including the ones for sanitary pads, which means that technically, uh, according to regulation, anyone who is selling or distributing products, um, inclusive of um, you know hypermarkets, supermarkets, uh, small shops and dukas, uh, all the way to uh, to NGOs that are distributing for relief, should be providing and 
uh, strictly and uniquely providing products that are certified. And again, that certification is not a one-off. That certification is an ongoing process of testing every single batch according to the lot and sampling requirements defined in the standard. Um, what's absolutely true is that the vast majority are not standardized. Um, most bureaus have on their website a list of certified products. So you can go onto UMBS's website or any Bureau of Standards website and just find a link to certified products and actually see the list that are certified. In Uganda, there are, uh, I believe, currently only six six products that are standardized, uh, and that's a big increase uh, just a few months ago. There were only two. Um, and so, so that is one way to check um, if you're on the side of purchasing uh, which products are indeed certified. And, and that's not limited to Uganda, but across standards bodies. Um, and then when it comes to actual enforcement, the only other thing you really can do is reporting to UMBS uh, if you see products that are out there that are not compliant with the standard or do not seem to be standardized. Um, but of course, uh, like any standards body in LMICs, they are uh, resource constrained, and so they might not be able to respond to all types of inquiries. But um, I do think that for um, informed purchase, um, it's not a practical or easy step for, for the average consumer to check on the website. So that really is limited, let's say, to more the uh, institutional uh, organizations or, or centers that are selling these types of products. Uh, it, enforcement is not um, an easy task. Uh, and I'd say, especially in areas where there is a lot of um, fake products on the market or, or copycat products in the market, um, it does make it quite difficult for consumers to be adequately protected. Thank you, Sonia, for that one. Um, I would like to close now the webinar because it's uh, one and a half hours and thank you very, very much, especially also a big thank goes out to Sophia who was preparing the presentation in the middle of a, a shift and in the middle of the coronavirus crisis. So really, really thank you, Sophia, um, for your dedication and for your knowledge to contribute today. The next uh, webinar we're planning for April, menstrual cups. I uh, we hope we're going to proceed. If you have any questions, um, for today, for a speaker, you can direct them um, to those uh, two emails. We will also have a recording ready for you that we will share um, for all those people who registered. So um, you can re-watch the webinar. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone who joined. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the team. Um, who prepared for the webinar today. Um, as usual, great teamwork. And with that, I wish you uh, a good rest of the day. Stay, stay safe wherever you are. Stay motivated and um, happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think, Veronique, uh, you're the one who then can close the webinar. Yep, I'm going to close. Merci. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.